Thanks for tuning in to No Wine in No Time. I'm your host, Dave, and today's a very special day for our channel. It marks our 200th episode, and I am so glad you're taking this wine journey with me. So today, we're going to talk about what makes a great wine great, and I have a spectacular one for you, but we're also going to take a little walk down memory lane. So five years ago, when I created No Wine in No Time, I did it on the premise that the world is full of so many beautiful wines, but so many consumers that come into my wine store and so many others around the world want a specific wine varietal from a specific place and really don't want to try anything else. They're not adventurous. So I try to figure, how can I make you a little bit more curious about the wines, teach you a little bit about what these grapes are, where they hail from, what makes them great, unique, and also what pairs with them. But most importantly, if you've never tried a wine that I'm featuring, what can you expect when you go to your local wine store and try it for the very first time? So I think No Wine and No Time has been a success. It certainly seems like it's the most comprehensive wine channel on the entire YouTube, if not the internet, and we're gonna keep going. Now, when I talk about what makes a great wine great, I rewind the clock back to 2018. And in 2018, I set out with some special friends. It was my wife's milestone birthday, and I wanted to give her something special to remember it by. We flew into Paris. 20 some days later, we flew out of Florence, and we went 3,200 kilometers through France and Italy exploring vineyards. Really, some of the greatest terroir in the entire world. Along the way, we stopped at Domaine de Nales, which is this exact wine. In 2018, we shot a No Wine and No Time video where I crouched down behind 100-year-old vines in Domaine de Nales' La Croix Vineyard. And those 100-year-old vines produce very little fruit, but exceptional quality fruit. But little did I know, this wine, the 2018 vintage that I was kneeling down beside that are actually in this bottle, would produce a 97 point wine that was in the top 10 of Wine Spectator's top 100 list. This is an epic wine and we were there and you came along and explored that with us. Now, what makes a great wine great? Let's get to the vineyard. So when we think about the vineyard, first off, what makes a great wine? You gotta have great grapes to begin with. Those grapes need to be grown in the proper place so that they get the sun that they need, the rainfall that they need, and that they produce the highest quality fruit. There is one caveat to producing exceptional fruit, and that is how much rain do we get close to the harvest? If we get too much rain, very close to the harvest, grapevines are almost like straws. They'll pull that water up in and send it out to the globes of the grapes, diluting the fruit. 2018, Chateauneuf du Pape, La Croix, perfect harvest. Secondly, we talk about how those grapes get from the vineyard to the actual winemaker. Hand harvesting is best, and Domaine de Nales does 100% hand harvesting. Why hand harvesting? Because you can go into the vineyard and actually pick this bunch of grapes, take those, but leave a second one behind, come back a week later, get that one, and now they're all harvested at their absolute peak ripeness, highest sugar, greatest acidity, greatest balance in the wine. So that's exceptional. Now we also talk about terroir, the proper grapes in the proper terroir. Now terroir is a French word, which just kind of means all the environmental elements coming together. The sun, the wind, the rain, the soil, all those different things coming together. The grapes that are grown in Chateauneuf du Pape, which is the driest appellation in all the Rhone, which is in the southern part of uh, France, and also it's the one with the rockiest soil. So these grapes really have to struggle in this terroir. The little bush vines that you see in my visit to this vineyard 
they might have 50 foot roots that go out and try to find all the moisture and all the nutrients which really produces the highest quality fruit. Now also we talk about viticulture, the pruning, the pruning of the grapes. When we go out into the grape vineyard and we cut off some of the immature grapes, let's say in June in North America, uh, we are now allowing the grapes that are left behind to receive all of the energy of the plant, which produces better fruit. We also think of things like soil treatment, pest management. Are these vineyards using organic practices or are they using fungicides, pesticides, herbicides, and artificial fertilizers? Those do have a tremendous effect on the wine, but more importantly, how we feel the next day after drinking the wine. When you drink a glass of chemicals, you definitely feel worse the next day. Finally, we talk about things like cover crops. When you go back and look at the La Crau Domaine de Nales video, there's weeds everywhere because this vineyard believes that cover crops, in other words, weeds, allow them to not use things like um, glyphosate. Um, I hate to pick on California, but if you ever go to Napa Valley, you go up and down every one of those vineyards, there's not even a weed in between those rows, in most. I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but that's because they're spraying and killing those weeds, and that gets into your wine too. That's unacceptable. So, finally, in the process of what makes a great wine great, it's the wine making. So we have exceptional fruit that was produced in the right place, it was cultivated properly, let's say with organic principles, now it's in the actual winery. What do we do with it? First thing is we macerate and extract the flavors from the wine. So we think about a red wine. The red wine only gets its color from the skins. So how long after we crush the grapes do we allow the skins to stay in contact with the juice? That's called maceration and extraction. We're extracting flavors and also tannins from those grape skins. Then also we look at fermentation. How long are we going to run the fermentation? In other words, how dry do we want the wine to be? The longer we run the fermentation, higher the alcohol, the drier the wine. And finally, how much contact with oak do we have? If we look at Chateauneuf du Pop, these wines are based on 13 different grapes, 13. Um, and of these, the primary grape is one called Grenache. Grenache oxidizes easily, so what the winemaker does there is ferments that and ages that in stainless steel, then allows the other grapes to be aged in oak, then brings that cuvee or blend back together. It's really magic, and it's a lot of steps. You hear all the things I'm talking about, what makes a great wine great is all of these things. But finally, it's what's in your glass that makes the difference. When a wine achieves balance, and by balance I mean acid, tannins, fruit, alcohol, and wood, when all of those elements of the wine are singing at the same level, that's a perfect wine. So everybody has different scales, but when you look at one 97 points, and top 10 of the top 100 for wine spectator who only does blind tasting, this is a special wine. Now you may be wondering what the price of this is. Uh, retail on this is $105. Um, and because it's such a well-structured wine, it has a tremendous ageability. In other words, it can age for decades. So sacrificing one of these for this video is something I enjoy doing because this wine will give me great pleasure today. But investing in a great wine like this will give you great pleasure for years in advance. So let's just see how the experts did on this. So this Chateauneuf du Pop, I mentioned there's 13 grapes that can be used uh, in the manufacturing of a Chateauneuf du Pop wine. This one has five of them. It has Grenache, Syrah, Morvedre, Cunois, and Vacares. Those are the five grapes in that order in the order of dominance in the wine. So the first thing that we notice when we look at this Domaine d'Anales 2018 Lacroix, Chateauneuf du Pop, 
is that the wine itself is opaque. We cannot see through it, but it does have some purplish edges. If we swirl to liberate the aromas, what leaps out of the glasses, black raspberry, plum, a little incense, um, a little spicy peppercorn, uh, really a, a beautiful bouquet. Now let's give it a taste and see if it's worth 97 points and $105. What an incredible bottle of wine. When it goes past your palate, the first thing you're going to notice uh, on immediate entry is this is a very bold wine. It has a fruit explosion when it first hits the palate. Everything from plum to black cherry to even a little bit of an orange peel in there a little bit. Mid-palate you feel beautiful acidity, well balanced, a lot of fruit, a lot of acidity, then we feel the tannins and the spices kick in. We get back to that incense and almost a, a garig type of flavor. We use the term garig a lot because the wild herbs grow among these vines and they get some herbalness like rosemary and thyme. And finally on the back side of the palate, the tannins are there, but they're not overwhelming. When we talk about tannins, there's velvety, there's dusty, and there's gripping. This is velvety. This is like drinking pure silk out of the glass. And this wine has a long way to go. So I just wanted to once again thank everybody in our audience for staying with us for 200 episodes. I ask that you go out and explore some of the back episodes uh, of No Wine in No Time. But I'm going to get back and enjoy a little bit more of Domaine Danale's uh, creation and go back through some of my old photo albums of the trip. And I ask that you come back next time, because soon you'll know wine in no time.